<clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 12 here this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The, the mic isn't to make me louder. It's just so the ones at the back can hear like the ones in the front. Um, I don't need a mic. <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and we're, we're preparing people in this church that lift their voice in the streets. You know one thing about a street preacher, he doesn't need a mic. When, when he learns to preach in the high street, when he comes into the church, um, no problem with being heard. But we're continuing from last week on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The gifts of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren... I would not have you ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, yeah. even as you were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, yeah. and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit withal. But for to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another faith by the same spirit. To another the gifts of healing by the same spirit. To another the working of miracles. To another prophecy. To another discerning of spirits. To another diverse kinds of tongues. To another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh. That one and the self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Let's pray. You know, the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing, yeah. and hearing by the word of God. We don't preach to fill an awake, we don't preach to just educate. Faith actually comes into your heart. How are you ever going to have faith to move into an operation of the gifts? How do you think you get from a place of not operating in the gifts to actually operating in the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit? How does that happen? Because the gifts operate by faith. It is actually faith in your heart. Normal faith. God-given faith. But you know what? To have faith to operate in the gifts are to see these things manifest in the church that the Bible speaks about. You need faith, you need stirred, you need your eyes open, you need your heart to become hungry. How does that happen? It's through the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God. It's by the Word of God or the reading of the Word of God or your personal study of the Word of God. In that dimension, you'll find that faith actually comes into your heart and you start saying, Lord, you Use me to prophesy or Lord grant me the gift of faith in this crisis situation so as we preach the word let faith come into your heart this morning through the word of God let faith enter your heart let faith be stirred in your heart and arise let's pray together you pray for yourself let's pray together pray for this per preacher here this morning has to preach to you bunch bunch but let's agree together that through the word of god faith will come into the hearts and stir us to look to the spirit of god i tell you saints it's him that does it but he needs vessels that will believe him Father, we thank you for your word, your truth, your life, your light here this morning. I thank you that your Holy Spirit indwells us.
us that this church is his temple, his tabernacle, his dwelling place, that you're building a church, that you're fitly framing us together, and this church to be the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. We know he's here, we know he indwells us, we know he moves in our midst, but we are asking that these nine supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit that belong to him, and they're under his governance, under his sovereignty. My God, I pray that you raise up our hearts to believe you, and that he would shine forth in these gifts uniquely in our individual lives and in every situation of life and in our midst as a church. Nor God, not by pressure or force or demand, but my God, we want to make ourselves available. And even here this morning, let faith come into the heart. You have said, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Bless your word this morning in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. We dealt with two gifts of the Holy Spirit last week. If you missed last week's message, go back. It'll be online soon. Listen to it. Watch that message. You want this to become a part of your actual life. But we said uh, last week that the manifestation of the Spirit, and that's what these nine gifts are called. They're called manifestations of the Spirit. He owns them. He gives them. He is the one that brings them forth. He is the one who distributes them in the church. He gives them to certain individuals, not to be their possession, but he manifests these gifts at a particular time, in a particular way. They are manifestations of the Spirit. His character, his voice, his wisdom, his knowledge, his power, his discernment, all that the Holy Spirit is. These gifts make him be seen or revealed or felt in the midst of the church. We said last week in chapter 12, 31, it says, but covet earnestly the best gifts. The word covet earnestly, it's one Greek word, zelo. It means to be very zealous for these gifts, to burn with the fire, to be dissatisfied that you do not have them. And that's what zeal or zeal means. It means to covet earnestly. You're saying, Lord, I must have these gifts. Lord, I want these gifts. Lord, I'm praying for these gifts. Lord, I'm believing you for these gifts. Lord, I'm going to study the Bible and see what you teach about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And we're commanded in the Bible. Bible, through the Apostle Paul, covet yeah. earnestly the gifts. It's a command. It's a teaching of the Scripture. And we're told three times in these chapters that we're to be zealous over the gifts, especially prophecy. And I just want to continue on from last week. Last week we dealt with the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge. I hope you know what the difference is. I hope you've studied it during the week. I hope if I ask you here this morning what we taught on last week, that you can tell me, every single one, you can tell me what a word of knowledge is and what a word of wisdom is. You know Mark Anderson, who was here a month ago preaching, teaching the word of God in our midst. When his little daughter was seven years old, and we used to know her when she was just there, a cute young girl, she read the entire Bible from cover to cover. She read it with understanding. She read it prayerfully. And she was only seven years old. Her grandfather actually come to her, uh, uh, Gary, Pastor Gary, who's been here also, and he tried to catch her out with some hard questions. He said, you've read the Bible. Do you understand it? So from from the Old Testament, he pulled out some obscure stories and he mentioned a certain person. She was able to tell him everything. But she says, Grandad, there's one thing I don't understand, which I'd like you to tell me and explain to me. And she says, he says, yes, dear, well, what is it? Grandad, what's the difference between a word of knowledge and a word of wisdom. That is a seven year old read in the Bible. Seems when you just read it and don't ask, or don't stop to understand it. You could be missing an awful lot. That seven year old said, what's the difference between a word of wisdom and a word of knowledge? I bet if you ask her today, she could tell you what the difference between them is. Only a seven year old. Oh, that we had the heart of a seven year old here this morning. Amen. Let me just before I move on mention 
about this thing called the word of knowledge. It was in Pastor Gary's church at a conference, I think several years ago, that um, Candace and me, we, we went to the meeting and we're sitting there in the meeting and the preacher's preaching, he stops and he starts getting words of knowledge for people in the audience, in the congregation. And he actually stopped. And what I didn't know was he was actually bringing forth knowledge about my wife over information that I didn't know. You see, Candace in her physical body had got to a place where she couldn't brush her hair in the morning. Her, her arms, everything was stiff. She couldn't lift her arms. She couldn't lift them above her head. When we were in South Africa, this, um, um, the, the physiotherapist actually treated her and diagnosed her and said, and listen to this carefully, he actually said he's a doctor and he said you've got focal dystonia. Okay, I don't know what that is, but he did and she did. She was suffering with it. The doctor in South Africa, we came back to Ireland, she went in to see the doctor in Ireland and the Irish doctor actually treated her and said, you're right, rotary cuff is unhooked. Okay, so two diagnoses, two doctors in two different countries. I don't know either of those terms. I don't know what she's got. I just know she can't do anything in the mornings. She is absolutely stiff. She's in pain. And it's getting in the way of her traveling and her ministry. As we're sitting in that church, the preacher stops. There's somebody here. Come forward and we'll pray for you. So he carries on praying for people. And then he stops again. And he says, listen to me. There, there's a woman here with a right rotary cuff which is unhooked. He get both diagnoses. I'm beside her. I don't know it's her he's talking about. I'm her husband, live with her every day. But that preacher, he's a preacher, he's a spiritual man. He, he evangelizes the lost and she puts up her hand and says, that's me. Saints, that's one gift of the Holy Spirit. That's a word of knowledge and it was accurate. Do you know what? When he first gave the words, I was skeptical. I went, here we go again. I've seen a lot of carn artists. I've seen a lot of the faults. And you know what? I'm sitting there skeptical. And I go, is this God or is it not? But when she stuck that hand up and when she told me the story afterwards, I went, man, that's God revealing those things. Now there's a problem. You see, the word, the gift of the word of knowledge doesn't heal you, does it? You need another gift in order for anything to happen. But saints here to this morning, let me move on to another few of these gifts of the Holy Spirit. Reading in verse 9, and this is the third gift of the Spirit, first the word of wisdom. Second, the word of knowledge. But thirdly, in verse 9, to another by the, sorry, to another faith by the same Spirit. Faith as a gift of the Holy Spirit. We need to understand what they are. What is faith? Faith means to be fully persuaded, absolutely confident. Trusting entirely without doubt or fear. It's that your heart has come to a full assurance. Now I'm not talking about saving faith. That's not what the gift is. You know, faith is a gift when you get born again. It's a gift. You actually receive from God the gift of faith. Where you go, I know he's real. I know he's alive. I know he's forgiven me. I know he's the creator of all things. That is a gift of faith. But that isn't the same gift it's talking about here. That is saving faith. Then we know as Christians we're to live by faith. We pray by faith. We walk by faith. We do everything by faith. We follow God by faith. That isn't the gift it's talking about here. You see, the fruit of faith... And in Galatians it talks about faith as a fruit. What does it mean? It grows. It has to go through the seasons. It starts small. And as you walk with God in the Spirit, in step with the Spirit, your faith gradually grows through the months, through the years. Faith grows. If you're born again a Christian, faith is going to grow in you. I tell you, your faith at one month old is a lot different when you're 10 years old. If you're walking in the Spirit, growing the Spirit, your faith actually grows. But this gift of the Spirit's radically different. 
then faith is a fruit. Faith comes slowly. The gift of faith comes immediately, supernaturally, as a gift of the Holy Spirit. It is an immediate impartation of an absolute confidence that God is going to do something in a specific need or a specific prayer. You didn't have it a minute ago. You didn't have it an hour ago. You didn't have it yesterday. But suddenly the Holy Spirit gives you faith to believe for something you've never been able to believe for. A situation arises and what you find is the Holy Spirit gives you faith either in the church or in your life individually. This faith makes you speak or act in a certain way that you wouldn't do without it. You're going to say certain things because this gift of faith has come. You can speak with assurance. You speak with authority. You speak with confidence. And I know. How do you know, Brother Keith? I just know. Amen. I know that I know that I know. This gift of faith, it is going to happen. Believe me, I know it is going to happen. I don't know when. I don't know how. But I'm absolutely persuaded that nothing can move me. It's not just hoping. Well, I hope God is going to work. I hope he'll work in my life. I hope he answers my prayer. I hope this situation changes. That is not the gift of faith. The gift of faith immediately comes. You could have been, yes, walking with God in faith. You believe God, you believe the promises of God, but you have a giant, you have a brick wall, you have an army, you have a trial, you, you have a, a, a river you cannot cross, yeah. and you're praying, and you're asking and saying, oh God, help me, I feel such unbelief, now, I don't know what to do, and suddenly the Holy Spirit imparts to you spontaneously into it, you don't earn it, you don't work it up, you don't grow into it, suddenly you get it instantly. And you go, I can believe for that thing that a minute ago I, I, I could not believe. Since I'm telling you what the Holy Spirit is willing to do in this church, He wants to do in this church, and He wants to do in your life, He can do that. I don't care if you reach a point of doubt, fear, unbelief, you can pray for this gift of faith. It is a gift that God imparts to you. You see, the Holy Spirit chooses who to give this gift to and when to give this gift to you. It's in the Old Testament we see men who certainly have this gift of faith. In 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 1, we read about the story of Elijah. And the Lord tells him, go and speak to the king. Prophesy to the king that for the next three and a half years, there's not going to be dew nor rain unless my word says it. Now can you imagine when it rains regularly? Could you imagine doing that in Ireland? Going to the king, the president, the prime minister and saying, do you know what? Dew is not going to settle on the grass. No, no, not dew in the morning. And no rain is going to come until I say it's going to come. Now if you're going to walk into the palace and say that, you better have the gift of faith. We're told that Elijah went to the king and said, no rain, no true, until my word says it's going to happen. For the next three and a half years, there was no rain, no dew. There was a famine. There was a drought in the land of Israel. Elijah often operated in faith. And this gift of faith given by God. People read about these men like Elijah and Peter and they think there's something different from us. They think they're not like us. Why? They do something that cannot naturally be done. And they think they had a different relationship. No. No man could go into the palace and say, you know what? It's not going to rain unless I say it's going to rain. That is a supernatural faith that God gives. You remember at the end of that three and a half years, then Elijah goes and prays for the rain. It's the time for the rain to come, but he's still got to pray. God said the rain's going to come, but you are going to pray for it. Miracles don't happen without prayer. These gifts do not operate without prayer. Remember when he went and prayed? He prayed and he sent a servant and said, go see if you see any clouds. Come back, no clouds. Well, let's pray again. Prayed again. What a man of faith, huh? No, let's pray again. Go, go have a look. No, still no clouds. Let's pray again. Go have a look. Let's pray again. Go have a look. Still no clouds. Are you sure you're praying the right prayer? 
You sure you're in the will of God? I don't see anything. You go look. I'll keep praying. He goes looking again. Seven times he sends him. And on that seventh time when he goes and looks, he goes, Man, I see one tiny cloud the size of a man's hand. And Elijah, do you know what he says? And praise God, that's all I need. And he, he hitches up his dress and he runs to the palace. You know why? He knows the rain is coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a supernatural faith that could affect the weather, that could affect famine, that could affect a nation. Don't tell me that's normal faith. That's not normal faith. That is the gift of faith. And yet, do you remember what James chapter 5 says about this Elijah with yeah, the gift yeah, yeah. of faith? Do you remember he got so discouraged when that evil Jezebel, the queen of Israel, Ahab's wife, she ruled the roost. You know, a wife's not meant to rule the roost. A, a man's ahead of that home. Yeah, but Jezebel ruled the roost, ruled the kingdom. And we're told that she sends a message to the man of God saying, Mark my words, this time tomorrow you're going to be a dead man. Hey, he stood against all the false prophets. He called fire down from heaven. He says it's not going to rain and it doesn't rain. And then he says it will rain and it does rain. And he sees remarkable miracles. And when he comes to call fire down on the altar, he says pour water over the sacrifice and I'll call fire down. And then this little wicked witchcraft of a queen sends a little email, Facebook message to him. And what does he do? He runs for his life to skirt saying, Woe is me, I wish I could die. And he sits under a tree and he, he lies there. And the Lord comes and said, Man, there's no point trying to speak to this guy. I'll send an angel, feed him an angel's food. And he'll be able to run and live on it for 40 days. And you know what? When he gets in that cave, then I'll speak to him. Don't tell me these men were different than you and I. Do you know what it says in James 5? That Elijah was a man. He knew fear. He knew discouragement. He had feelings. He had thoughts. He had emotions. He had distractions. He could have his emotions hit the roof and then hit the floor. He was a man of like of passions. But I tell you, all these miracles he'd done, there was a gift of faith he knew. He was confident. I know fire is going gonna, is gonna to come down. I know that fire will come down. I know it's not going to rain. I know the rain is going to come. He knew. How did he know? This gift of faith actually brings you a knowledge. Do you remember in the Old Testament, Joshua was leading the army of Israel. And the, they've almost defeated their enemies. And night is coming in. The sun is about to set. And he goes, man, if we don't win this battle tonight, they're going to escape. They're going to regroup. And they'll attack us again. And many lives are going to die. But if we could just gain a few hours or maybe half a day, we'll defeat the enemy. They'll never rise again. And a thought comes into that man's mind. Why don't you stop the sun for 24 hours? Amen. Where did that thought? No man in history ever had a thought like yeah, that. Yeah. And that miracle never happened at any other time. But here's a man who says, I believe if I speak to that sun, everything is going to stop. <laughs> Do you realize if only the sun stopped, we're going to have a big wreck in the universe? Yeah. When he speaks... Not only does the sun have to stop, the moon has to stop, the earth, the stars, the planets, the universe. I, I tell you, or else we're going to have a train wreck. But what do you have? That man, he speaks to the sun. What is that? That's faith. Yeah. That is a supernatural faith. You're doing something go, am I crazy? Yeah. Am I mad? But I know it's going to happen. I know, you know, for 24 hours the sun was held in its place and they defeated their enemies and Israel won. And this is the gift of faith that I'm telling you about. Jesus talked about it in the New Testament. Remember in Matthew 21, he talked about mountain moving Faith. That's not normal faith. Here in Corinthians in chapter 13 verse 1. It talks about having faith to move mountains. This is actually the gift of faith that the Lord is talking about. He says there is a faith that if you speak to this mountain. This ginormous mountain. You don't need to dig it away. You don't need to bring explosives in. You don't need to bring trucks in. You actually speak to it and say, Be ye cast into the sea, and it'll be done. 
If you have a certain type of faith, that isn't normal faith or you'd be moving an awful lot of things around in this city. That is a supernatural gift of faith. Do you remember in Acts chapter 3, whenever Peter and John are on their way to prayer, at the hour of prayer, at the time of prayer, they're going to the place of prayer in the temple with other Christians to pray. Some people are so led of the Spirit to say, I don't need to go to a house of prayer at a certain time with a certain group of people to pray. I'm led of the Spirit. Then your Spirit's no Spirit at all. Certainly isn't the Spirit I read about. In the midst of revival, Peter and John are led of the Spirit. They're just going there as normal. All the believers are praying there. I'm going there to meet with them. As they walk to the prayer meeting at 9 o'clock in the morning, Peter and John look at a man, a lame man, sitting at the side of the road. Do you realize how many times they walk past him? Hundreds of times. They have, he's sitting in the same place in the city that he's always sat in for years. All through Christ's ministry, he sat there. Christ never healed him. He sat there. But here's the two men. They're walking to the prayer meeting. Doing what they normally do. And in verse 4 it says. And Peter fastening his eyes upon him. Something's happening here. Why did he fasten his eyes upon him? This isn't a normal day. This isn't a glance. He actually stops and he fixes his eyes upon him. And he, and he, looks, he said look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said unto him, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand. Look what's happening here. He's walked past him many times, maybe hundreds of times. The must have looked at him and, why doesn't Jesus heal him? Well, why hasn't a miracle happened? Why hasn't the Lord had compassion on them? And they keep walking past them, maybe daily, to a prayer meeting. But this day is different. What's different about this day? The gift of faith comes in. And he fastens his eyes upon him. And you know what he says? Man, do I have something for you? I know what's just about to happen. Peter, how did you know? Do you think Peter went about the city just pulling people up who are lame? Do you think Peter walked about going, where's all the, where, where's all the cell? Just pray for all of them and I'll, I'll grab them all. All these cripples, I'll grab them all by the hand and pull them up. He didn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Neither did Jesus. They didn't do that. But this day is different. The gift of faith comes in and he grabs them by a hand and he pulls them up. You see, this is the gift of of faith operating. It's actually operating them. That's why Peter done that. Or what about Acts chapter 9? Where we're actually told that Peter was called to the home of a young lady who's just died. Do you want to be called to a house where someone's just died? And they say, we want you to pray for her. What are you going to do? Read them a sermon about the resurrection? Make an excuse? What are you going to do? Peter gets to the house, it's filled with mourning people, crying, parents, relatives, brothers, sisters. She's a young lady, she's died early. What does he do? First thing he does, puts them all out of the room. Why? Because they don't believe. <coughs> do you know why he put them out? And then it says he kneeled down and he prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. He's speaking to a dead body after prayer. He knows what's going to happen. Where did that come from? He doesn't go around raising people from the dead every day. It's a sovereign act. You can only do that if God is going to do it. And you need the faith of God in order to do it. That little lady rose up. She came alive. She was raised from the dead. That, that was the, the gift of faith in operation. You know, many years ago, my mum was discouraged. She was discouraged with her church, discouraged what was going on. Yeah. She said, Lord, do you still work supernaturally? Do you still work in parents? She went to a, another special meeting and she walked in that night. <coughs> and all through the worship, it was a tin roof building that's still there. 
And all these young boys, they're throwing boulders and throwing stones. And when it hit the roof, it went down, 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 down. And all you can hear is this all through the worship. And the preacher, the man Sandy Thompson, evangelist, who prayed for me when I got baptized in the Spirit, he come up and he stood in that pulpit and he turned sideways. And he said very quietly, he says, in Jesus' name, very quietly. My mom's sitting there discouraged. And he says, very quietly, in Jesus' name, not one more stone will hit this roof. And they've been hitting left, right, and center up till he said that. And he turned around, opened his text, began preaching. And my mom's sitting there waiting, <laughs> waiting. Not one Hallelujah. single more stone hit that film. What was that? That's the gift of faith. Yeah. That is faith actually in, in operation. I've heard of people rebuking the wind and that wind actually stopped. Do you remember, what was it, two years ago when we prayed here on a Wednesday night? That young man, Dean, 24 hours before, was he 16 years old? Had, had fell, hit his head, had that brain hemorrhage. He's on a life support machine. He is only given days to live. The doctors want to take him off that machine. Do you remember us praying here on that Wednesday night? Yeah, yeah. Saints, I know I prayed that night not as normal. Yeah. That night as I stood here, I said, we're not praying for someone. We're not praying unless there's a miracle. I knew stand here. God has heard us. Yeah. God is going to answer. I knew it. I knew the prayer of faith had been prayed. And yeah, all, all these prayers, we can start mentioning them here. Don't forget what God has done. That was the prayer of faith. Do you know what? By Saturday, the doctors wanted to switch that machine off. They said, there's nothing we can do. I didn't say that. A doctor said that. Yeah. On Saturday, he comes out of that. And he's still living in sin. That's right. And I prayed that night, Lord, don't heal him just to live in sin. Yeah. Save him. I'm still praying that. He's out there somewhere living in sin. But I've got faith in my heart. The same God who brought him off that machine, stopped him dropping into a hell, can also save him. I'm after that soul for Jesus Christ. We're, we're talking about a gift of faith that actually comes into your heart. You, you, you know the story of Shammy, who I was in a room with when I was in the army. He'd had a brain hemorrhage, three holes drilled in his head, pain in every single joint of his body. And I began witnessing to him. He, he's about 19, uh, I'm about 20 thereabouts. And I said to him, he's hearing the gospel for the first time. He was raised Catholic, raised by nuns. The nuns were teachers. When he got to 16, he kicked God out the window, said, I'm finished with God. If that's God, if that's religion, I want nothing to do with God. I, he moved into my room. I start witnessing to him. He, every week he falls into deep depression, has nightmares, agony in his body. And you can hear all the noise in his body from here to the high street. You would hear every creak of the neck. And you know what? When I began speaking to him, this is what I said. Shammy. The day you get saved, you're going to get healed. I don't go about saying that. I knew it. I absolutely knew it. I wasn't trying to believe. I wasn't hoping. I wasn't just believing. I absolutely knew. Every time a witness is said, Shami, the day you get saved, you're going to get healed. For six months, I tell him this. I know you're going to get From the top of your head to the sole of your feet, you'll be instantly healed. Well, I'll tell you a bit more about that in a second. But, but saints, that was a gift of faith. I've got no doubt. How do I know? Well, the result was there. Okay. The actual result was there. So that's the third gift, the gift of faith. Let me move on in verse 9 to another gift. The gifts of healing. Notice here the gifts of healing is plural. Gifts, not gift of healing. If someone tells you I've got a gift of healing... Go back and read your Bible. It's gifts of healing. It's plural gifts. And this is the only gift out of the nine that's like this. It's multiple. It's varied. It's diverse. Yeah. But it's also gifts of healings. In the Greek it's plural. The healings are actually plural. It says in verse 28, gifts of healings, very accurately. There is a variety of gifts within healing. Now notice what healing means, the word healing. It means to sew together, 
to mend, to repair, to bring back to its original condition, to restore. It means to heal the sickened body, the sickened mind, the sickened emotions, to cast out demons and to repair the damage the demons have done in a body. That is healing. Here we see that the Holy Spirit gives to certain people in the church gifts of healing. He can bring a gift of healing any time he actually, actually wants. It's a supernatural gift given by him. Gifts of healing is mentioned three times in this chapter. The New Testament is filled. Read Matthew. It's filled with healings. It is God's will to heal. I do believe he still heals. I believe healing is as much for us today in Limerick, in this church, as it was in the first century for the first church. I believe that he is a healer. I absolutely believe that. But notice here what we see in the Bible. John chapter 5. Jesus walks to the pool of Bethsaida. Mm -hmm. There's a multitude of sick people around that pool. Yeah. Multitudes. Blind, deaf, dumb, crippled. All manners of disease, all manners of breakages and carnage and injuries. But Jesus only walks up to one man who was lame in his feet. He healed that one man, then he walked away. He left multitudes sick. Do you hear what I'm saying? People ask the Lord, well, if you've got the gift to heal, why not go into the hospital and heal everyone? Well, I haven't seen anyone healed recently. Saints, we need to realize that even the Messiah, God's Son, Jesus Christ, did not just go and heal everyone yeah. at the pool of Bethsaida. He had the power, he had the ability, he had everything. But since he knows the hearts of all men, he, he, he never heals anyone who doesn't have faith. You're, you're saying, well, I want him to heal, heal me. Do you believe? Right. Do you know Christ used to ask the sick, he never rebuked anyone who didn't get healed. Never. Never, and we don't. And we don't blame their unbelief, we don't. Right. He only once in the entire New Testament healed a person sovereignly where faith wasn't involved. Only once. It can happen, it does happen. But normally look at them and say, man, I can see you've got faith. Yeah. He says, be it unto you according to your faith. Yeah. So even to operate in faith, I tell you, the person receiving, I can't save you if you're not willing to get saved. I can't heal you if you don't want healed. If you're not willing to look to him in faith, I can't heal your sicknesses. But give me the biggest atheist, I tell you, the most impossible case, a sinner living in immorality and drugs. And if I can talk to them and get them to look to Christ, they can get healed immediately. And you've got all the people in the church limping about sick. I've seen it, saints. I've seen sinners come off the street instantly being healed. And there's a Christian sitting here being praying for 10 years. Don't ask me to explain all that. I'm just telling you what the Bible actually says. In John 5, he heals one man, walks away. Or what about Acts 3, as we said, John and Peter with the man at the gate, beautiful. They heal him. Christ had walked past him, never healed him. But they heal him. Notice that they actually grab him and God put strength in his legs. Can you imagine having the gift of faith but not the gift of healing? Can you imagine having the word of knowledge? God's going to heal you no gift of healing. Nothing will actually happen. The gifts often actually operate side by side. It says about that man at the gate beautiful. Immediately his feet and his ankle bones receive strength. If Peter had operated in presumption, he would have lifted up a man who had collapsed in a heap. But you know what happened when he pulled him? He's operating under the gift of faith. And that man, as he pulls him, immediately strength comes into his ankles. He's immediately healed. Hallelujah. Do you know what the Bible says? He went leaping and jumping and praising the Lord. I tell you, no layman can do that. It's utterly impossible. But you know what's happened here? It's the gift of healing that is operating. You know in the Old Testament, 2 Kings chapter 5, there's a captain of Syria, the leader of the armies of Syria. He's got a little slave girl who's a Jewess. She's an Israeli. And she's in that home as a slave, a servant. And they get the 
diagnosis from the doctor. He's just got leprosy. And you know what? She could have cursed him, said, good on him, God's judging him. But she's in that home with compassion. She's a slave. She's being bought. She's living where she doesn't want to live. But she says, could you tell the master, I know someone who can help him. And that's sad. You can't send someone to a church nowadays. Say, I know a church. You'll go get healed. Yeah. You'll go there and hear the word of God. You'll hear from God. God will repair your backslidden condition. This is what we need back in the church again. Churches where God is, you can meet God. Well, she told her master, I know a man called Elisha. If you go to him, he'll hear from God for you. So he took his soldiers' road. He took gold with them and silver and rewards. And he got to the door and he knocked on the door. And the servant came. And he goes up to Elisha and said, the, the captain of the host, he's got leprosy. He wants you to come down and pray. He doesn't come down. The prophet stays up in his bedroom. And he says, go tell him to go wash in Jordan seven times and he's be healed. He'll be cleansed from, from his leprosy. Elijah doesn't even, Elisha doesn't show his face. Just go do it. Yeah. Do you know what happened to that man? He got angry, resentful. And he says, who does he think? Do you know the Jordan's the dirtiest river in the nation? Can he not send me to a beautiful, big, flowing <laughs> river? Can, can he not tell me to walk a thousand miles and then I'll be healed? You want me to get into the, that, that mire of a river, the Jordan in Israel? Are you serious? He got angry, offended, and his pride almost lost him his healing. And he got in his chariot and started riding. And one of the men says, Master, if he would have asked you some great thing, would you have done it? Yes. Wouldn't you just try? Wouldn't you go? Well, he goes to Jordan on that seventh step. He's totally healed. All the leprosy's gone. You know what I'm saying? Healing can be manifest in different ways. You, you go, there's nothing healing in those waters of Jordan. They can't heal anyone. But I'm telling you, I know God. If you wash in that, you'll be totally healed. Yeah. That was a miracle of healing. And it came through that act of uh, uh, obedience. Do you remember in Mark chapter 7? Christ put his fingers in a man's ear. Why did he do it? Did he have to do that? He was immediately healed. Or what about John chapter 9? He spat on the ground, on the dirt of the ground, and he made some clay mixture, and he applied it on the eyes of the blind man. Why did he do that? You see, there's strange things with real healing. Do you know Jesus never healed a man the same way twice? Never. We're commanded, anoint the sick. We're commanded to lay hands on them and pray. But Jesus, you know why? Because they said, man, they'd be sticking clay in people's eyes all over the place. Saying, this, this is how you do it. Doesn't today's church do it? They say, they wiggle their hips over there. And they do a little jiggle and they shake away. And they fall and let's all do it. A load of trash. A yeah. load of rubbish. Nothing happens. They're, they're copying someone in Australia or America or Canada. Copycats, that's all they are. Well, I'm shaking like they do in Canada. God help you, where's that gift of the Spirit? That's right, where's laughing in the Spirit? Where, what gift is that? Would yeah. you mind showing me in the Bible? I want supernatural gifts that heal the sick. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the gifts in this actual Bible that can heal people and raise them up. Remember the man with the withered arm? Here he is, he's got a withered arm. Ever seen a man with a withered arm? Ever seen someone, their arm has never grown? Jesus speaks to that man. And what does he say? Stretch forth thine hand. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I can't do it. I've never been able to do it from a child. You want me to stretch forth my hand? You see, this is healing. Stretch forth your hand. And you'll be immediately healed. I can't do that. Well, fine, go home withered up. Go home the way you came in here. But if you listen to me, if you have faith in God, that arm is going to become totally whole. Yeah, do you know what the man done? He stretched it forth. He was immediately healed. I do believe that he's the very same. Let me finish what I was saying about Shammy there. Remember Shammy? For six months I'm telling him, God is going to heal you. The day you get saved, God's going to heal you. Well, I always used to tell the guys in the army, I'd get up Sunday morning, well guys, are you coming, are, are you coming uh, to the meeting with me? You promised last Sunday. And they all said, 
Uh, next week, wake us up next week. They've all got hangovers. They've had drugs. They're all out on the drink, the booze. And I'd wake up on a Sunday morning. I've got things they brought in from the town. There was once a Christmas tree. There was once a big metal thing from the town. Uh, once this girl was leaning over the, the top of my bed and went, who are you? I tell you, all sorts of things turned up. Every Sunday morning I'd say, right guys, it was a running joke. I'd say, right guys, are you ready for church? <laughs> and it all goes through the same thing every week, but not this morning. Shammy jumps out of his bed, says, I'm coming with you. Praise the Lord. I go, keep Alleluia. your mouth shut. Praise the Lord. We get in the car, I don't want to say much, yeah. we go to church. The preacher, thank God he preached the gospel, made an appeal. He says, I'm not saved, I need saved. Praise he come forward, we prayed with them. He got born again. Wow. And you know what? He turned to me. What's he going to say? And he says, Keith, called me Paddy. Paddy, he said, you said. I don't have the gift of faith anymore. I'm going, why didn't you keep your big mouth shut? What am I going to do? I can't heal anybody. But I knew the gift of faith was operating. I'm telling them, I know you're going to get healed that day. From the top of your head, I had a full confidence. Now the gift of faith is in there. <laughs> And I'm looking at him and going, we'll pray for you. I'm looking around, who's got the most faith in the church building? Let's get Brother Jeff there. Brother Jeff, help! <laughs> we prayed for Shammy. We just laid hands. I'm terrified now. But I don't need the gift of faith now. I need the gift of healing. Yeah. The gifts of healings. And as we pray, I'm terrified now. But I'm saying, oh Lord, do it. And you know what happened from the top of his head to the soul's feet? Instantly the Lord. healed. And all the noise in his body, apart from his neck, immediately left. That can't happen. Hallelujah. That cannot happen. Hallelujah. Do you know, Shami, we went back to her room. He's shouting, testifying to everyone. I'm saved, Hallelujah. I'm born. God healed me. All the guys are just looking at him. Said, man, we've got another crazy guy. This thing is spreading, batting down. Be careful, they'll get you next. <laughs> Shammy went and got his shorts on, hadn't run, used to be a regimental runner. He got his shorts on and he went running. He went and damaged his leg again. So we have another meeting, we pray for him again, instantly heal. Two, a week later, I've got another friend staying with us, a German friend, says, why is his neck still creaking? I says, I, I don't know. He says, let's, let's pray for his neck, that this noise goes. We, we sat Shammy down, laid hands on him. We're praying, say, go, go, move your neck. And he goes, dead slowly. Do you know why? Because he didn't expect any. Moves it slowly, he goes, it's gone. It's gone. Saints, healing is actually real. Do you know the Lord healed my neck when I wrecked at skiing? Increasingly three months it's getting worse. Do you know I wrecked both my knees and was to go to an operation. I was in agony, could hardly walk. God healed me in one night through the prayer of faith. Do you know I had diarrhea and vomiting for one entire year from October to October. Every three days I have diarrhea and vomiting. My whole system empties and I collapse in exhaustion. But after one year I'm in a meeting. And a man prophesies, says, he's about to pray for him. I said, I, I need prayed for, for healing. Goes to lay hands on me and he stops, smiles at me. He says, you do know you're going to have to go back to Ireland to preach, don't you? Hallelujah. And he dropped my head and went, yes, I do. He says, just so we've got that straight, now let's pray. Instantly I'm healed. Amen. Do you know, my knees are fine. My stomach is fine. My neck is fine. I can assure you what the Lord actually does is wonderful and remarkable but verse 10 it goes further to another the working of miracles miracles is different than healings these are all gifts god wants to put in this church now i i believe it's our let's pray let's believe god saints it's beyond you you don't have this you can't do it any more than i can heal shammy i cannot heal shammy but I need those gifts of the Spirit operating. And you know what? I was only 21. I'm in a working job, 9 to 5, and a whole lot more. I, I, I tell you, I'm not a preacher. I'd be scared to preach in a church. But I tell you, we laid hands on him, and he's healed. The working of miracles is different. Again, it's plural. Workings. Miracles. Mm. The Greek is actually energima. 
of miracles. Energies of miracles. The word miracles is dunamis, but it's the plural. Dunamisis. What is dynamite? What is dunamis? It is dynamite or a dynamo. What does a dynamo do? It'll keep going, keep going, keep... Yeah. There's power there. It's generating power. We're talking about real gifts, a work of miracles. This is not healing. What are miracles? They're mighty works. Mighty works. Powerful works. They're wonders. They're signs. They're things you cannot explain. They're things that leave you open-mouthed. There are, these are things that point you as a signpost to Jesus Christ. It is power to accomplish the uncomplishable. To do what cannot be doing, done. But it's not healing. It's above and beyond the working of nature. Our natural laws within our whole society. And it always confirms the word of God. Remember Jesus turned water into wine. This was the beginning of miracles. Since miracles are not only for the Bible. Or to here in Asia or Africa. They're for Limerick. We need miracles. Yeah. Jesus turned water into wine. That's a miracle. Or remember Christ saying, speak to the mountain. Tell it to get in that sea. That's going to be a miracle. It's not a healing. It's a miracle that breaks the normal law of gravity. All the laws that our society is run by. You remember when Jesus calmed the storm. He rebuked the wind. But he commanded the sea to be still. And what happened? It all become absolutely still. Or the multiplying of the five loaves and the two fishes. That is a miracle, but nobody got healed. Everybody's in awe. They go, this is a miracle. We know that something unusual has happened. Remember when Peter walked in the water, what was that? That wasn't normal faith. I tell you, that was, a, that was some other type of faith. But you know what? No matter how much faith you have, Unless miracles come into play, you can't walk in water. I've never in my life seen someone walk in water. I, I, I've seen a pond once where it said, please no walking on the water. But I've never actually seen anyone walk in the water. It was a miracle. It wasn't a healing. It was a miracle. Yeah. I believe raising the dead is also a miracle. It's beyond healing. Yeah. It's beyond repair. It's beyond fixing things. I believe raising the dead is a miracle. It is a sovereign act of God. It's a supernatural intervention. Do you know, if I had these gifts and I could use them as I will, every time one of you should die, we would never have a church where anyone died. We'll never have a funeral. I've never preached a funeral. I never want to preach a funeral, okay? You hear me? Make sure you're listening. But, but I assure you, to raise the dead, if you die... I won't be praying for you to rise unless miracles and faith is in operation. Yeah, oh, no chance I'm going to lay hands on you. I'm not going through that turmoil. But let faith come. Mm. A man came to my mum's door many years ago, knocked on the door late one night. I'm standing behind her. And the man, the bearded man, he, he looked like John the Baptist or Elijah. And he acted like it. He was an old-fashioned prophet of God. He said, Lila... Our, one of our cousins had died, slipped in the snow, she left a young boy, my, my, my second cousin, my good friend, we played together. His mom had fell in the snow, she got a blood clot, she died. And John stand there at the door, says, Lila, I believe God's told me to go raise her up, will you come? I'm looking for one man in this church who will go with me, and will pray the prayer of faith. You know what my mom said, she says, I wish he'd asked me. So he went in his way. My dad wasn't there. My dad was working nights. And he went around all those doors and they tried to talk him out of it. And you know what? He never went and prayed. Couldn't find one person who'd go with him. Do I believe something would have happened? I do. I sure do believe something would have happened that night. It actually says in Matthew 13, 58, that Jesus did no, not many mighty works. That's miracles. Not many mighty works there. Why? Why did Jesus not? Because of their unbelief. Yeah. We're talking about Christ. Or what about Mark 6 and 5? And he could there do no mighty works 
save that he laid hands upon a few sick folk. Few, not many, not most, not all, a few. And he healed them, but he couldn't do miracles. He'd done a few healings, but he couldn't. This is Christ. Do you see? Why? Because they would not believe. He couldn't find a believing people. Saints, either these gifts are going to operate here or they're not going to operate here. Either they can operate in your life or they're not going to operate in your life. But it takes faith to believe God. You can sit here for the next 20 years saying, I'm waiting for God to save me. The Bible doesn't say it. It says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll sit here for 20 years. You're going to have a lot of cobwebs on you. We're going to have to dust you down every week. Because you're going to sit there. And I'm telling you, if you're sick in your body and a mink for me, hey saints, I've got sick this year. I've lost some preaching because of sickness. I know what it is to be sick. But I'm telling you, you can, you, you can roll about crying, whimpering, saying God isn't hear me. Why isn't God answering my prayer? Hold on. If you believe God, we're talking about miracles. Miracles come in strange ways. Remember Moses' rod. He stretched forth a wooden rod. The sea opens up before him. Remember Elijah's mantle. He goes down to the Jordan, takes his mantle, hits the Jordan, it parts. That is a miracle. It's against the laws of nature. Or what about Samson's jawbone? He takes a, 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 a new jawbone. He slays a thousand Philistines. You can't do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't do that. We're talking about miracles. Hallelujah. God can make a jawbone miracle. There's yes. nothing in that jawbone. It, it, it's nothing. That mantle is nothing. That's where Catholicism goes a lot, goes wrong. It's lights. It's special garments. It's some token. It's something religious. You missed it. The miracles are in God and a relationship with God, Him actual self. I can tell you of those miracles. Saints, I, I'm going to preach this all in one Sunday. It's not happening. But saints, we are going to pray. We are going to believe. Even if it takes four weeks, we've got a mini-series within a series. Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing by the Word of God. I have known of people praying for cars that didn't start. I watched as a young boy when I was 10, 12 years old, the car wouldn't start. My mom's not a mechanic. She's not a Paul. What did she do? What is a good woman going to do? Us men don't rarely get a miracle in the car. You know why? We think we know how to fix it. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get, give me the right tools. I'll fix this. But the women are a bit wiser. Or maybe they know the limits. My mom, she gets out of the car, lays her hands on the car. She prays in Jesus' name, gets in, turns ignition, and it works. Some do, I, I go, how did that happen? Don't ask any questions. Let's just keep driving. I've watched Candace do the same. Isn't that right? So my mom and Candace... If you ever have a broken car, you can either go to the mechanic or ask the ladies. Some lady with a bit of faith. I have watched Candace. We get in a spot, my first thought, I, since I just don't have any leadings to lay hands on a car. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? I, I, I'm flesh and blood, but she's got faith to do it. Please pray for the car. I, I, I'm wise enough to say, you, you pray, I'll just say amen at the end. But lay hands. What are miracles? They're not healings, but they're unusual interventions in the normal course of things. Let me finish with this here today. Some years ago, we were in a financial crisis. My entire life from 13 years old, God spoke to me in a meeting and said, Son, never make known your needs to man. Okay? I don't go begging. I don't go dropping hints. I don't, I, I don't do that. The only times I ever talk about that is to educate, to teach, to inform where we need to grow. But I'm telling you, when I, and Candace is a witness, when I've been in the worst financial conditions, I never told a soul. Nobody, I put my best coat on. I made sure that there was nothing that could give a sign. I said to her, don't you be saying and to anyone else. You know why? Either God is going to do a miracle or we are in serious trouble. Mm -hmm. I mean serious. Since once several years ago, we got to a point where we only have a few hundred pounds in the bank. And we had about four or five different trips. Candace is a witness. 
four or five different trips to do. To minister in Germany and Sweden and England and Wales and these other places. And I'm go, I have the faith. I go, I'm meant to be in Sweden. I know it. I've got the word of God for there. I'm meant to be in Germany. I'm meant to be in Wales. I know I'm to be there. And Candice is saying, she books all the flights. She's looking at, she doesn't have the faith. I've got the faith. I know we're meant to be there. I know this is God. You know, I'm not a foolish man. And I don't take risks. Yeah. I don't say, well, let's just trust the Lord. I don't do that. I'm actually quite wise. I'm sensible. But I said to her, I said, go book the flights. She says, but we won't have enough money. I said, we've just got enough. I don't know whether we had 150 left or 200. That's all we have. We've got no money for bills in the coming months. We don't have it. We've got no means of income to cover that. And we're in serious trouble. But one thing I know, I'm going to go preach. This is in the will of God. I know I'm in the will of God. We're going to do this. Well, I, Candace went and booked all those flights, trembling, I'm sure, praying, oh God, I hope he knows what he's doing. Booking all the flights, we went there, and we're in a crisis. Saints, we're in a real crisis. But within a few months, we're standing in our kitchen. You know, there's no mail in Ireland on Saturdays. Our mail went next door. We didn't get it to Saturday. And there's a letter comes. And we're standing in our kitchen, and I open it and go, boy, if I remember rightly. I handed to Candace and said, open that, read it. She opens it, and it's the biggest single gift I've ever had in my entire life. Hallelujah. Enormous <laughs> gift. Massive. We don't really know the guy. And in the letter he says, God told me last September, last year, and he gave the date. And he said, I, he told me when to send it to you, the date to send it to you. He told me how much, and he told me what it was for. And you know, as I handed that to Candace, she broke down weeping in her kitchen. That's a miracle. Yeah, don't think it's just a healing. That is a divine miracle. I don't like those situations. But you know what? When you're at the Red Sea, the Egyptian army's behind you. There's mountains either side of you. And there's an impassable sea in front of you. What are you going to do? Right. Do you know what that is? Either this is the end or you're going to have a miracle from God. What are you going to do when you walk out onto the battlefield and here's all of Israel, everyone's scared to fight Goliath, but here's Goliath and I curse your God. I curse your God. Where is your God? Where is the God of Israel? Send me a man to fight. Little David goes out with a slingshot, doesn't wear that armor. Yeah. Too big for me. Haven't tried it. Yeah. And he goes there with his little slingshot, dancing, doing the wee <laughs> skip out to the giant. Do you know what that big giant covered in armor? Child of a man. Do you know what he says? Are you having a joke here? Are you having me on? You, you send this little child out to me. Yeah. I'm going to eat him up and spit him out. Yeah. Or, or, is this a joke? <laughs> send me a man. Do you know what? He slung that slingshot. Yeah. And hit him in the one and only yeah. place that was free. I don't believe David was such... I believe he was an expert slingshot. Mm. But I believe there's a whole lot more in this. Yeah. There's a God in heaven. This is a crisis hour in the church of that day. We need a God of miracles. Amen. We need a supernatural intervention. Yeah. And he said, man, either it's all over today. Or we're going to have the greatest victory in Israel's history that we'll talk about for all time. Yeah. Since it was a miracle to bring down the enemy. Do you need... A miracle here today? <coughs> Are you facing a Red Sea? Do you need healing here today? Do you need these gifts of wisdom, of knowledge? All these gifts? Since these gifts are for this church, don't look to the worldwide body. Look to a church that wants to evangelize this city and see revival come and it will not compromise the, the preaching of the truth. This is our hour to pray. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. There's shammies out there need healed. There's lost people out there need reached. There's financial provisions we need in this church. There's things you need in your life. Saints, and in the midst of it all, 
It's going to be to the glory of God. Do you know why? Because all we are is a small people, small like David in our own eyes. Man, you as a church would be a fool to take on this generation. Do you know what? Guess what? We're going to take on this generation. Hallelujah. What you say in this church is a young David. We have no armor. We have no finance. We don't have all that we need. We don't have all the education. But we, if we unite as one and pray and have faith, we're going to run out onto that battlefield against Goliath and say, either this is the last day of my life, or we're going to see a miracle that will be talked about for all time. That the God of Israel is alive. Let's stand here. Hallelujah. Thank you.